Frank was shot while working for the BBC in Saudi Arabia eight years ago. Six bullets left him partially paralyzed. He describes himself as a backpacker at heart, but his disability has forced him to review the way he travels. Well, thank goodness for the internet, because um, if you're based in a wheelchair like me, um, it does usually give you the option to click on something to say, I'm going to need wheelchair assistance. And then once I get to the airport, I say, right, this is what I need, this is what I don't need. Otherwise, you kind of get corralled, if you're not careful, into some sort of wheelchair ghetto, which is no fun. Good morning. Was it good and tough? Nowadays, flying is much more of a challenge. Is that going to be wide enough to go? Do you want to try it? He has to travel with both a wheelchair and a walking frame. Hello. Well, actually, this is a rare luxury to be able to pre-board, to get on board before everybody else. Normally, I'm kind of kept back waiting till the last. It's a little wide. Well, Boarding a plane takes a lot longer than before and everything involves a great deal more planning. Right. This is actually a pretty good workout for me anyhow. It's good for my legs. Air travel for me is very different now from what it was before I was shot and disabled eight years ago. But, you know, you overcome, you improvise, you adapt. And it's really all about the attitude of the airline and the ground handling staff. Mostly, people are really friendly and helpful, and they'll do everything they can to make it easy for you. One of the things that disabled people have to take into account when you're flying is how they're going to get to the toilet. Um, on long-haul flights, nearly always, they provide a, um, an in-flight wheelchair to get somebody who uses a wheelchair from here to the toilet. The flight from London to Stockholm went smoothly. But when Frank went to get off the plane and was offered a narrow aisle chair to do this, no one could find his own personal wheelchair. Well, we just had a bit of an altercation there. Obviously, they'd like me off the plane, and I'd like to get off the plane, but until they find my wheelchair, I just don't want to do that because I can't, <laughs> I can't live in this thing. Um, and unfortunately, if you're dependent on a wheelchair, that is your legs. So um, I'm unfortunately having to be very stubborn about this. So it's fine. So he's just got, but he needs it to, to sign it off. Right. Okay, good. Uh, no, I'll do it. Thanks. I can do this. Do you want to put it down? Thanks. You, you don't need to touch oh. it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, please, for the last time, you don't have to touch me. Thanks. That's great. The um, ground handling staff always very good about trying to kind of um, mollycoddle you a little bit and kind of manhandle you, which I absolutely hate um, because what movement and mobility I have got left, I want to be able to do myself. So um, I'm always telling people to back off and stop handling me. When Frank reached the baggage hall, there was more bad news. His walking frame had gone missing somewhere between London and Hi. Stockholm. On the plane, maybe? No, I've checked that. It's definitely it's not, not on the, on plane. the plane. So where could it have so, gone? So, my, I need to call London to see right. that it's not left at the gate. I know. Look, it's, it's not a disaster. Losing this, Whatever for me, is a disaster. Because, <laughs> you know... But it's still, for me, it's a disaster. Now. This is why I, I try never to be separated from them. As and soon I, as I let it out of my sight, somebody goes and does something stupid with it. Unfortunately, in this case, it was a miscommunications between the airport and the handling agents, which meant that the assistant needed requests that we had requested from there was cancelled. This should absolutely not happen, and we truly apologise for it. With the frame lost for now, Frank decides to continue his journey into central Stockholm, which means having to travel by train. Arlanda Express hope that our visitors will have a pleasant stay in Stockholm. 
This is really scary. Oh, that's a, I'd say that's it's a bit scary that because there's a gap like that. I'm not going to fall through it, but I've got to do a kind of kangaroo hop on this to get over the gap. I've had worse. His destination, the Scandic Victoria Tower Hotel, which claims to be one of the most disabled friendly in Europe. Ah, you've even got a, a me-sized desk here. So, let me give you my passport. And... Great, thank you. But before Frank checked into his room, he met up with Magnus Berglund, the disability ambassador for Scandic Hotels. Uh, she's uh, called Ada. Ada. Uh, she's my service dog. When we're building now the rooms, the more of the disabled rooms, we sell it for everyone. Because we have now the signs where everyone like them. People don't say, yeah, I'm getting the handicap room. They're saying, I get the bed, they're going up and down. So we have people that are coming in and said, can I have the room with the bed? That's exactly what we were trying to do. But Magnus, what about the cost for all of this? There surely must be a lot of extra cost involved in putting in these features. And we see it as an investment and not like a cost. Ah, OK, 1801, here we go. Well, we've heard so much about this being so wonderfully disabled access friendly. Um, that'll be good. So I'll do that and then I press this and it opens automatically. Ah, OK. Let's try again. Here we go. No view. That is incredibly frustrating. Um, so my head is here, and this is, you know, quite a tall wheelchair. And I'm like, ah, where's the view? I can't see anything. So the bed raises up like that, which is nice, actually. That's nice being able to have that. I mean, it's a hospital bed, but it doesn't feel like a hospital. So that's good. Somebody has thoughtfully left out a kettle here. Uh, in case I want to make something, but where do I connect this to? Um, remember, I'm in a wheelchair and there is no sign of what on earth I plug this into. Right, the wet room. This is lovely. Very nice indeed. Um, I mean, I don't actually need these things, but um, obviously lots of people do. So and that's nice. They stay up there. I have the general impression that this feels like a room designed by somebody standing up and I don't think, it doesn't feel like it's been validated by somebody in a wheelchair. Um, I'm only saying all of this because this hotel prides itself on being so wheelchair friendly and they have made a real effort, but they're not quite there yet. The main reason Frank had travelled to Stockholm was to meet a table tennis player who's preparing for one of the biggest championships in her life. Well, Anna Karin's done her warm-up. She's now just started her match and you probably noticed she's the only person in a wheelchair in this whole place. They're not playing down to her. She's actually competing from a wheelchair against able-bodied people and she's going to be representing Sweden at the Paralympics. It's very close, 8-7. Anna Karin spends a lot of time flying around the world to take part in international competitions. So what's travel like for her? I was very afraid from the beginning to, to travel with my wheelchair uh, because I was afraid they were forgetting it, to break it. Uh, but uh, it's easier to travel with the wheelchair than without. Before heading back to London, there was just enough time for Frank to pit his skills against one of the best table tennis players in the world. Perfect. Well done. That's your career in sports. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> getting around Stockholm in a wheelchair has been pretty easy. In fact, the only really difficult part of this journey has been getting off the plane. And I have to say that as somebody who's only spent the most recent years of their life using a wheelchair, well, I'm very lucky to have been born into this era because, what, 20, 30 years ago, getting around even a capital city like Stockholm would have been quite a challenge. So we've come a long way since then. 